twisted. We've been talking about just different things in the Bible that get twisted over time. And then they kind of end up meaning things that really weren't intended or are viewed or quoted in ways that God never intended. How many here would say that you really aren't necessarily like totally satisfied with your income level? I mean, just like it'd, it'd be nice to have just a little bit more. Anybody in the room say, I, I just, if I could just get a little bit more, I mean, I could be, I'm not really totally satisfied. Come on, how many would, I'm not really just satisfied with that. And so, I, for those of you who that's the case, I taped a hundred dollar bill under one of the pews. And so, <laughs> nobody's looking. Probably should go, I know you, there's no way you put a hundred dollar bill in it. <laughs> this week, we're going to be talking about Paul's words to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, and how that verse often gets twisted and has been twisted. It's, money is the root of all evil. In fact, that, if you're familiar, you may be familiar, but uh, Pink Floyd... How many remember Pink Floyd? Pink Floyd. Back in the 70s, had an album called Dark Side of the Moon. And uh, in it, they have a song called Money. And in that particular song, even the lyrics just simply say that money, so they say, is the root of all evil in the world today. It's quoted. How many have ever heard somebody quote that? Yeah, that, that recognition that, that, that money is really kind of the root of all evil, we know that that isn't necessarily what the verse says. It is a twist of that particular verse of Scripture. So grab your Bible, if you would, and turn to Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Are you there? If you're there, wave at me. All right. That's all you're getting there. You're getting there. Not always waved at me. So I, I, trust me, I can keep track of who waves and who doesn't. I'm no, just kidding. Look at what he says. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let's pray. God, thank you that we could be in the sanctuary this morning. And I'm so thankful, God, for your people. And they're so gracious and uh, opportunities to be together to worship you and uh, to preach the word. I believe your word will not return void, but it'll accomplish what you please today. That means it'll change my life. It'll change our lives. Faith will grow in our hearts and we'll leave this place more like Jesus. That's our prayer. So that we could let the world see Jesus is the answer. So help us, God, as we're in the word today. We trust God you'll get the praise. In Jesus' name, we say amen. amen. And some of you maybe was were reading that verse for the love of money is the uh, root of all kinds of evil. Like, whew. Man, I got by that one because, you know, that's some rich, greedy person. Doesn't really apply to my life. Well, the question is, how would you know if you've fallen into the trap of the love of money? Well, it may surprise you, but actually the Bible actually gives us a definition. Ecclesiastes says it this way. He says that uh, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Remember I just asked you a few... I know I just set you up. I'm sorry. But I asked you just a few minutes ago, how many would say, well, I could, it's just, if I could just get a little bit more. I think it was Howard Hughes who they asked the question, Howard, how much money is enough? Just a little bit more. You know what I'm talking about? We think about the whole idea of the definition, you know, that, you know, that, that recognize that, that the definition of whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Maybe that makes you a little bit uncomfortable today. Because 
as we think about it, as we consider that particular text, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, sometimes we read past that and go, well, you know, thank God that doesn't apply to me because clearly I don't love money. That's for some rich individual out there. They're, they're the ones that are caught up in that. But the Bible clearly tells us that the love of money causes us to not be satisfied with our income. How many know that the satisfaction bar has a tendency to move? I remember when I got my first job, $1.61 and a half cents an hour. I'm thinking, ho, ho, I'm, we're in the money. $1.61 and a half cents an hour. And then, you know, I ended up uh, leaving that job and uh, became an uh, assistant manager at Taco Bell. And I'm making like 650 bucks a month. <laughs> How many, how many are with me? Some of you guys are with me? And I remember I went to General Motors and I'm like, sweet! I'm making $8.50 an hour. How many? That was how long ago I got hired by those of you guys that are wondering what kind of that meant. The, 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 the satisfaction bar has a tendency to kind of move upwards. And suddenly, the, the love of money or for the love of money takes on a whole new meaning in our lives. Let's look at elements of the context that Paul is writing from. We've talked about the fact that we need to understand context. And so uh, we think about who's the author. Paul is the author writing to Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor who he declares, Paul himself says that he is his son in the faith because of their close relationship And connection, we talked about the whole idea of trying to recognize or consider what is the major theme. What's the major theme that Paul is trying to emphasize? In the sixth chapter, the major theme is that godliness is more important than money. I mean, no, that's true. Godliness is more important than money. In fact, the NIV Reader's Version says in the sixth verse of the sixth chapter... You gain a lot when you live a godly life. But you must be happy with what you have. We didn't bring anything into the world and we can't take anything out of it. If we have food and clothing, we will be happy with that. What do you say? You gain a lot when you live a... You gain a lot when you live a You gain a lot when you live a godly life and frequently in our culture we are we are we are propelled by uh, advertising we're propelled by the culture that we live in the more stuff the higher the level of our income the better off we're going to be well there's a story about a rich guy And he found out he had a terminal disease and was going to die. And so he went home, he packed a a briefcase full of money, and he put it in the attic. His wife said, what are you doing putting a briefcase full of money in the attic? Well, when I die, he said, I'm going to go to heaven, and on my way up, I'm going to grab it. (laughs) Well, it came to the place where he ended up passing away, and so out of curiosity, she went upstairs. She looked in the attic, and sure enough, there was the briefcase full of money. She said, I I told that guy he should have put it in the basement. (laughs) A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Let's read the 8th verse together. The 8th verse says this. If we have, we will be happy. Let's read it one more time. If we have, we will be happy. Think about it. No iPhone. No iPad. No Netflix, cable TV. If we have Food and clothing. Can you, can you kind of like get your mind around that? You know, the, uh, it's just kind of like, if we have food and clothing, let us be happy with that. 
Can I just, just let, me, let me try to let this, let this statement kind of like settle in your, your thinking, in your, your spirit. Your the richest aren't those who have the most, but those who need the least. Think about that. I want to say it one more time because I think that it is it's vital in our, in our thinking, in our life, our lifestyle. The richest aren't those who have the most, but those who need the least. In developing nations, many believers, they got dirt floors. They don't have any running water. They don't have any hot water. Many areas they don't have, they don't even have a, a flushing toilet. Things that we take for granted, they don't even have. And yet there's one thing that I have discovered, at least in my experience and travel throughout elements of developing worlds. I've been in uh, western Nepal, I've been in areas of India, I've been in Haiti, I've been in uh, southern Mexico in the mountains with the uh, Mazateco and Zapoteco Indians. And they, they have no running water. They, it, they, but what I've discovered is they have something that sometimes we as believers in America miss. They have joy and peace. I remember being in western Nepal where we were so far out that uh, when they, the kids would actually come out to the, to the little road and they would actually go out to touch the vehicle because there's a vehicle going down the road. And yet one thing that I constantly was, was observed that when we would get together for fellowship, we'd get together in prayer time, we'd get together in their worship time, they were like... <sighs> in fact, there was a couple of times I'm thinking, Lord, I'm here to preach. And I need to get saved. These, I'm serious. These people are just like, and they're like, and they've got nothing. I remember being out and they're collecting manure. Ladies are out in the wicker basket collecting manure, and the reason they're collecting manure is so that they could throw it into a little cistern. They would put a little water and they'd mix it up. They'd cap the cistern, and that would create a, a butane gas. They'd siphon the butane gas off so they would have a stove. And yet, they just had an element of amazing joy, recognizing that the richest aren't those who have the most, but those who need the least. And then the next thing I'd like you to maybe really seriously consider is that discontentment can make a rich person poor, while contentment can make a poor person rich. Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. When you live a godly life, you, it, it's, it's good for you. It's important for us to keep our focus where it ought to be. Because Paul goes on to pen in the ninth verse of the sixth chapter, people who want to get rich are tempted. They fall into a trap. These are important verses, friends. They are tripped up by wanting many foolish and harmful things. Those who live like that are dragged down by what they do. They are destroyed and die. Tenth verse, Paul pens this. Love for money causes all kinds of evil. Some people want to get rich. They wander away from the faith. They have wounded themselves with many sorrows. Do you know somebody like that? Who at one time was on fire for Jesus, but because of the things of this life and because of the pursuit of stuff, all of a sudden started missing church. They started, started things began to be diverted. And next thing you know, because of the importance of stuff, the fire that they had for Jesus has waned. It's gone out. That's why Paul is so emphatic about his, his, his speaking to Timothy so that Timothy could communicate that. Remember, Timothy is a preacher. And Paul is encouraging Timothy so that Timothy could be a communicator to people in his sphere of influence. And he's saying to them, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's, it's possible, maybe after listening to me preach, that you may conclude in this moment that money is bad. But can I just tell you that that is not the case? Having money isn't bad, but loving money 
is very dangerous. In fact, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters at the same time. He will hate one of them and love the other. Or he will be faithful to one and dislike the other. You can't serve God and money at the same time. It's no wonder that Paul is so urgent in his, his, his communication to Timothy because money is frequently the number one competitor for the hearts of people. It distracts us from the true riches of God. And sometimes there are like two extremes as it relates to money. One is what might be considered the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel could easily perhaps be defined like this. If, I, if I'm godly... I live a godly life, if I am, have enough faith, if I sow enough seed or I give enough money, then God will make me rich. Can I just tell you that I never preached that in Haiti. I didn't preach it in southern Mexico. I didn't, I didn't preach it in western Nepal. I didn't preach it in India. It doesn't fit in America either because it's not Biblical. Yes, there is an aspect of reciprocity. Yes, God blesses his people, but giving doesn't make us rich. Well, not monetarily. God is faithful. Can I get an amen? Our goal is that we would realize that when God blesses us, we, are, we recognize that he's the one to receive the glory. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 8 says this, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. How many know that whenever anything happens, in fact I have it on my, my Facebook, if anything good ever results, it is because of Jesus. He is the faithful one. He is the one who is to receive the glory. and all. He's the one who gives us power to get wealth. And I'm thankful to God for his blessing that he pours out in our lives. Also, there's what might be considered, you know, the poverty gospel. The poverty gospel is that, you know, it's somehow sinful to have stuff. It's godly somehow to, to not have anything, to be poor. How many know that we shouldn't go to either extreme? We shouldn't tr twist the truth in either way. If you become wealthy, you don't need to apologize. Maximize it for the glory of God. If God blesses you and he pours it out on your life, and I'm praying that he does that for many of you. Nothing to apologize for because Jesus is still the central focus of my life, right? He's still the reason that I, I, I live. He's the, he's the reason that I have purpose. It's to him, to, for him to receive the glory. Money isn't necessarily the sin and uh, having things isn't necessarily the sin, but it's dangerous to love money. Paul says it this way in the 17th verse, back in the 6th chapter. He says, command people who are rich in this world not to be proud. Tell them not to put their hope in riches. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm not putting my hope in my 401k. Amen. My hope isn't necessarily in my retirement plan. My hope isn't necessarily in my savings. My hope isn't necessarily in my home. My hope isn't necessarily in anything other than Jesus Christ and him crucified and him resurrected from the dead. And because he died for me, he's seated at the right hand of the throne. He is interceding for me that the promises of the new covenant will come into pass in my life. And that one of these days I'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That people can see that Jesus is alive and well in my life. He says, command people who are rich in this world not to be proud. Tell them not to put their hope in riches. Wealth is so uncertain. Command those who are rich to put their hope in God. He richly provides us with everything we need. And we, when we read that, that we may read kind of like past that. Because like, you know what? I, I'm not necessarily someone who's rich. Well, 
I want you to maybe read that in a global context. 3.6 billion people or 1 in 10 people on the planet live on less than $2 a month. I think that we're kind of rich. We recognize that we, we are people who are blessed. In fact, if you have a car, that puts you in the top 9% of the world's wealth. Many of you got hundreds of dollars in your pocket. You have a cell phone. Your purse. You have a lot of stuff. And thank God for stuff. But the problem is is that sometimes it can distract. The the pursuit of that can cause us to lose our focus and not put the emphasis where it needs to be. And that is on our walk with Jesus. Discontentment makes rich people poor. Contentment can make anybody rich. Paul says, command them not to be proud. Tell them not to put their hope in riches. Wealth is so uncertain. Money often promises things that only God can provide. Money often, wealth often provides or promises happiness, security, and significance. In fact, if I drive up in a beater, I might have a little bit of embarrassment. If I drive up and I don't necessarily have nice clothes, I might feel a little bit embarrassed. But if I drive up in a new car, the right purse, the right kind of clothes, elements of security, elements of influence, If we think that we need more money to be happy and satisfied and secured, we have been deceived. Money cannot meet our deepest needs. Only Jesus can. Stuff will never provide the peace, the contentment that we need to receive from the Lord Jesus Christ because our sin has been forgiven. In fact, you think about it, the less Jesus I have, the more money looks good. The more Jesus I have, the more likely it is that I'm going to have contentment in my life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Godliness with contempt is great gain. In fact, Isaiah chapter 55 verse 2 says, Why do you spend money on what is not bread? This is a huge verse, right? Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your wages on what doesn't satisfy? In other words, we're pursuing the stuff, we're pursuing all, and those things aren't necessarily going to bring the satisfaction that only Jesus can bring. We're distracted by it. He said, listen carefully to me and eat what's good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. It's not wrong to have stuff. It's wrong for us to be distracted by stuff. He said, the love of money is the root of all evil. In fact, Paul says it this way in the 18th verse. He says, tell them to use their money to do what? Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Money can't meet your deepest needs, only Jesus can. And the less Jesus I have, the more money looks good. The more Jesus I have, the greater satisfaction I'm going to have. The love for money is the cause of all kinds of evil. Twisted sometimes to think, well, money's the root of all evil. Well, that's not the case. The love of money is the root of all evil. How many in this room would say, only Jesus will rule my heart? How many in this room? Only Jesus is going to rule my heart. When God blesses my life, my goal is to reflect the fact that he's the provider. He's the one who gives me power to get wealth. He's the one who's the redeemer. Don't put your trust in uncertain riches. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. 
Because he will bring blessing, encouragement to your life. Because one of these days, you and I are going to breathe our last. It's a fact. When that happens, how many in this room say, I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. What's going to rule my heart? Come on, I, let, let this sink. Because again, a lot of times we go, well, you know, the love of money. Well, I don't love money because that's for rich people. What we're talking about is the distraction of the pursuit of wealth. Distracting us from an ongoing strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Putting Christ first. Putting God first in our lives. As opposed to the pursuit of stuff. I mean, this room say, only, only Jesus is going to rule my life. Come on, only Jesus is going to rule my life. Only Jesus is going to rule my heart. I'm committing myself, God, to saying, I want people to see Christ in me. And I refuse to be distracted by the love of money. But God, we're thankful in this room. How many in this room are thankful for God's blessing in your life? I mean, God has given you some stuff. How many here, anybody here been to Stuff Mark? You know what I'm saying? God's giving you some stuff. And again, I, please don't think that I'm talking about the fact that you need to get rid of it all. Get rid of whatever's distracting you. Get rid of what's distracting you. If it's distracting you, get it out of your life because Jesus needs to be in the pursuit. People are, man, you got a lot of stuff. It's because I serve a good God. Jesus, how many, how many know that no matter what happens, no matter what day it is, no matter what hour it is, what, what day of the week it is, no matter where I'm at, whether, I'm, whether you're in the shopping uh, center, you're in the mall, you're in the marketplace, you're at the gas station, you're at your workplace, how many are like, I want Jesus to be seen in me. I want him to be, to, to be exposed in my life. God, thank you to get today that as we consider the whole idea of twisted, we're not going to twist the scripture. God, money isn't the problem. Our heart sometimes is the problem. And it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And so, Lord, we are not going to allow money to rule our hearts. We want you to rule our hearts. And we're saying to you, Lord, come and change and transform and confirm the fact that you are the Lord of our lives. You're the great and the glorious King. God, we're determined the only thing that's going to rule our hearts My heart is Jesus. Jesus, come and rule my heart. Rule my life. Holy Spirit, come. Examine me, Lord. If there are things that have gotten a hold of me, would you show it to me, Lord, in this moment? I want my heart to be open in this moment, God. I just want you to come and be able to speak to me, Lord. You're going to speak to me because you want the best for me. And so, Lord, in this room today, I'm praying. There's anyone in this sanctuary who needs to surrender their life to Jesus, that today would be their day. Say, Jesus, I want you to come and be the Lord of my life. I want to declare that I believe that you died and rose again.